Welcome to my webinar on MIG welding for beginners. My name is Steve Maxwell. I'm the creator of an online course called MIG Welding Skills for the Home Workshop. I also happen to be the instructor on that course. Uh, and I get a lot of questions from people who think they might want to get into welding but aren't really sure what it's all about. So that's the purpose of this, this webinar. I'm going to be uh, just kind of giving you an overview of the process. I'm going to be talking to you about the kinds of things you can make, um, how to select a MIG welder, what exactly the process is. I'm going to explain to you why it's the easiest welding process to learn. Uh, it's, it's actually uh, a boon for any hobbyist who wants to uh, bring welding into their life. Uh, the welders are fairly inexpensive. I mean, they can get expensive too, but you can get a good one for not very much money. Uh, in half an hour of instruction, you're going to be laying down serviceable beads of weld on uh, mild steel and you're going to have some success. So that's what this webinar is all about. Um, I want to mention too that from time to time I'm going to be referring to my course and some of the footage that you see here in this webinar I've taken from that course just because it shows things so well. Um, there's plenty of other footage in the course too but I'm just going to be making the basic points about uh, what MIG, MIG welding is, what it can do for you, uh, safety concerns. I often get that question from people. You know, what about the shock hazard? What about setting things on fire? You know, all that stuff. Um, I'm going to be talking about that. And um, I would just essentially like to introduce you to the whole concept of this wonderful MIG welding process and essentially the revolution, the creative revolution that it allows for uh, for people like you and me who want to build things, who want to fix things, you want to create and just have the joy of doing that. So without further ado, let's get busy. So I want to begin with talking about what exactly MIG welding is. Well, it's an electric welding process. This happens to be one of my MIG welders right here. Uh, so it uses an electric arc to generate heat that melts metal and sort of allows you to fuse that metal together while also automatically adding new metal to the weld so it's quite strong. Essentially that's why the MIG welding process is so simple is because a lot of the hard parts have been automated for you. Uh, I mean you still need to to start an arc um, but it's a one-handed process. There's a lot that happens in the in the, the welding gun itself uh, where new metal is being added and uh, an arc is being generated and heat occurs and fusion occurs. I'm going to get into a lot more detail later in the webinar about exactly how MIG welding works. But for now, let's get to the exciting part and let me give you an example of some of the things that you can make with a MIG welder. So essentially I just want to show you what I have made over the years. Uh, the first time I used a MIG welder was about 40 years ago and so I've seen the technology improve. I've seen the welders get smaller. I've seen them get easier to use, uh, much much cheaper to buy, uh, much more portable. I mean you don't necessarily need to use a big machine like this that's more or less stationary. Some are kind of um, almost as, as small as a gym bag say or even smaller and they're completely portable. You can plug them into a regular outlet um, they don't need special circuitry, although this one does, not all do. Um, but for now, let me show you some projects, some specific real-world projects uh, that I've done and uh, that I, I continue enjoy, to enjoy today. This video provides a little tour of some of the small jobs that I've done with my welder over the years. This is my 1990 F-150 half-ton. I live in the rust belt and I keep this vehicle oiled so body rust is not a problem but there was one little spot that uh, that got the better of me as you can see right here. Originally there was some wall-to-wall -wall carpeting on the floor and there was one spot that was holding moisture under the carpet and it caused this rust hole. Uh, you're actually looking right through the hole here to the, to the dirt underneath uh, but the welder made quick work of the repair. After cleaning and removing some of the loose and flaky rust, I welded a patch of new metal in from underneath the floor. Uh, the blobs you see around the perimeter of the patch are spot welds. So it's just where I've welded for a, a second, a little blob and then 
uh, wait and then another little blob and then wait and then another little blob. It, it's a technique that works very well on sheet metal like this. Uh, as a final step to this first initial phase, I've just grinded the surface flat. So we've got a good solid repair, but it still doesn't look all that great yet. I don't like auto body filler, so I do all my filling with solder, which is what you see here. Now it looks quite ugly uh, at the moment anyway, but I've cleaned the metal, heated it with a propane torch, and gone over it with some lead-free solder to just more than fill that little depressed area uh, in preparation for the next step, which is grinding and sanding this smooth. So here's the completed repair all flat and smooth and ready for some primer and paint. There are a few dark spots, as you can see, and those are actually small depressions. Uh, since this is a floor, I didn't bother filling that with any spot putty, but if I was doing this repair on an area of the vehicle where I, I could see, uh, then I would just apply some of that red-colored spot putty, sand it by hand, and you got a really great all-metal repair, ultimately thanks to that welder. This is a motorcycle backrest that I made uh, back in the early 1980s. It's actually the first time I ever used a MIG welder. I was working in the rides maintenance department at Canada's Wonderland, which is a big theme park up here in Canada, and I had the run of the maintenance shop when my shift was over, so I built this chrome backrest. It's just made out of mild steel, uh, fabricated it in the shop to fit this motorcycle, and uh, then sent it off to be chromed. And uh, so probably one of the fancier projects I've done with welding. I designed and built this bike rack for Canadian Home Workshop magazine. It's one of many projects I've created and published in that magazine over the years. This is made from three quarter inch steel pipe and one and a quarter inch steel pipe. It's a great design. It's worked well for many years and uh, it can hold quite a few bicycles too. Full plans and instructions for building this project as well as a bunch of others are part of the course. You'll get to that later. This is the same bike rack while I'm building it uh, in one end of my shop. You can see the, uh, the wood and gussets there are, are holding the, the top and two bottom pieces apart the right distance and then there's the uprights that are being welded in place. As I said, full instructions for making this project later on in the course. This is a close-up of the welds and the bike rack. This is actually one of the more challenging situations to, to create a neat weld where two pipes are meeting each other, but it's entirely possible. You'll learn all about doing this in the course, and um, this is what a, a solid and deeply penetrating weld looks like in the, in the finished product. This little part sitting in my vise is for a bread maker we've had. When it came from the factory, there was just a clip that was joining the uh, butterfly type piece to the actual shaft that's sitting in the jaws of the vise. That loosened up and it broke eventually. So I just popped it out, brought it to the shop, put a couple of spots of MIG weld on either side of the shaft where it meets that butterfly piece. And it's worked well for years after that. It's just a perfect repair. Didn't take long to do either. This is an eight foot wide snow blower that I refurbished. It was just dumped in the bush somewhere. Nothing much was working on it. A lot of parts were seized. The welder came in handy in a couple of situations here. I had to rebuild the whole mechanism whereby the chute could be swiveled hydraulically from one side to the other. And uh, my MIG welder came in handy there for welding lugs onto the outside of the chute so that I could put a cable on it that would, that would grip it and move with the cylinder. More recently, I had a little mishap with the snowblower. I had a small tree after um, blowing out a, a neighbor's laneway and it caused this sort of corkscrew thing, the thing that moves the snow into the center section to get blown out, causes that, caused that to be broken. Um, but about an hour or so with the welder and it was all fixed up as good as new. This is a metal stair frame uh, that I built uh, with my son for a uh, house he has on our property. It's made out of two inch black iron pipe. We have some offset metal um, platforms here, metal treads. Uh, they're covered with cherry wood now in the final installation, but this is what the metal frame looked like after we had it all welded up and we're ready to take it to, to his place, to Robert's place. Here you can see the frame in the shop and the cutouts there in that vertical piece. We had that done in a, a separate shop where they do this sort of work. They used a, 
a water blast method to actually follow a design that we made to blast through that quarter inch thick steel and it did a great job uh, the crispness of this design is really amazing this is a circulator pump in a hydronic heating system i installed at my place and there's the custom bracket i made in order to support it uh, it's at an angle to the joist it's a little bit of a particular situation and a little bit of mild steel and some work with the welder and came up with quite a nice bracket here. This is a gate that I made, also from black iron pipe. It goes along with those stairs I showed you before and a railing as well. But uh, this has been made entirely from black iron pipe, from black iron pipe fittings, and then also from a little bit of plate steel and some three quarter inch thick mild steel rod. This is a close up of the hinge of the gate. I've since installed a grease fitting in there kind of overkill really grease fitting on an in an indoor gate but it sure does make it swing quietly it's perfectly silent when we have that grease in place this bird sculpture is made out of number nine annealed fence wire so pretty flexible fairly thick and you can cut it in pieces and and weld it together for all kinds of shapes if you feel like getting creative needle nose vice grips do a great job holding these pieces of wire together you just don't want to use a, a pair that you care too much about because the end as you can see does get kind of fouled up with little bits of weld two of my boys are heavily into weight training and they ended up breaking some regular equipment that they bought so we strengthened it you can see the gussets and little extra pieces we've added here and there to make it stronger and it's just worked absolutely perfectly there's been no problems a few years ago, I decided I wanted to install a hand pump, a deep well hand pump on my household well. We have an electric submersible in this well, but I just wanted some a backup for pumping water by hand if necessary. But the well casing was not high enough. Uh, the pump would have been too close to the ground. So I bought a chunk of well casing and used the welder to weld it on. And down here you can see the bead and it extended the height of the casing just just right for this well pump installation as I mentioned before welders are handy for keeping older vehicles going this is underneath my truck and it's the exhaust system and the regular hanger had pretty well rusted out so I added a u-shaped chunk it's actually a, a u-bolt for exhaust system u-bolt clamp uh, but I just welded it on to the existing holder and um, just got quite a bit more life out of this exhaust system for very little work this stainless steel measuring cup is in our kitchen and the handle broke off so i did a little bit of quick mig, MIG welding to resecure the handle on uh, this is the inside view you can see the penetration in it uh, if you flip it over you can see the outside the weld is not that neat uh, i've since grounded it's not sharp or anything it's a little bit blobby but it's hard to uh, work with thin material like this. You really only have a second to give it a zap and to, uh, to make the connection. So it's lasted years like this and uh, we'll probably get many more years out of it too. I could show you many more projects around my place that I've used my welder for, but this is the last one I'm gonna show you in this video. It's a, it's a fence post pounder. So this is for pounding T-shaped steel fence posts into the soil. It's a two inch pipe and I have welded solid steel shaft into the top part so you can see the top end has the welding bead on it and then I've done some plug welds in the side so boring holes through and just welding right through the hole into the plug to the edge of the uh, pipe so exactly what does the MIG welding process look like well I'm going to be giving you a detailed tour in just a moment but now an overview so step one would be to clean the metal. Uh, that certainly makes welding easier, although a clean surface, a clean metal surface is not quite as crucial as if you're say soldering or brazing or something like that. But clean metal always welds more easily, so you might as well clean it. Uh, second step would be to connect this uh, ground cable. All MIG welders have a ground cable like this, which completes the circuit that allows the arc to be struck and to actually make the weld. Um, you can put on your safety equipment. At a minimum, that would be a welding helmet, like this one here. 
uh, and gloves. There are other safety um, items too. I'll be talking about those later in the webinar and uh, also about safety hazards in general and how you can protect yourself as you weld. Um, when you're all suited up, you turn on the welder, you start welding with the welding gun like this. Um, and then when you're finished, you let it cool off, take off the ground cable and, and you're finished. So now let's take a closer and detailed technical look at exactly how all this shakes down in the real world. In this video, I want to give you an overview of what's called a MIG welder. Uh, it's a kind of electric arc welder and the word MIG is an acronym. It stands for metal inert gas. It is actually the easiest welder for beginners, beginners to use. I'm not a professional welder, but I've been welding on and off for more than 30 years and the MIG welder is the thing. If you want to get involved in hobby welding, um, this is just the ticket because it's so easy to use. So as I mentioned, it's, it's a kind of electric welder, which means that it forms an arc and the arc during use, as you'll see, travels from this little wire here to the metal workpiece. And the reason it travels to the metal workpiece is because it wants to complete a circuit. Uh, this is a, called a ground cable, and it also connects to the metal you're welding. And it, it provides a path for the electricity to flow. So there's an arc uh, jumping in the airspace between this little wire and the metal you're welding, and that arc creates heat. Uh, and something else, too, um, one of the important features of the MIG welder is that it automatically advances new wire into the weld. So this is just sitting here right now, but if I were to turn it on, it's going to boot up in a second, you'll see that that wire actually extends on its own. I'll just press it for a second and you'll see. Now the reason for that is because most welding involves adding new metal to the joint that you're connecting. And this happens automatically with the MIG welder. Uh, the wire comes out, you can adjust the rate at which the wire comes out, as well as some other parameters on the machine. But this automatic wire advance is one of the reasons MIG welders are so easy to use. It's also why they're sometimes called wire feed welders, because they're feeding the wire in automatically. But Let's go around to the front of the machine now and I'll, and I'll show you a few parameters and how this machine is adjusted and used too. There are two main parameters when it comes to a MIG welder. One of them is voltage. You can see that here. I'm doing some welding right now, welding some, uh, some steel pipe. It's about an eighth of an inch wall thickness or so. And as it turns out, the 17.4 volts is what I want. Now, voltage on a MIG welder translates to the intensity of the arc. Now you want that arc to be intense enough that it melts metal on both pieces that are being joined, but not so powerful that it actually blows a hole through the metal. So you can see here, all MIG welders allow you to control the voltage. Now I'm in the green zone here because I have, as I'll show you, pre-programmed this machine for the kind of metal that I'm welding. So it's giving me a range of voltages so I can safely go from 16 volts to 18 volts. This would be too much, that would be too little. Given the metal that I've, that I've uh, told the, the welder that I'm welding. So uh, voltage, one parameter. Now the other parameter is inches per minute of wire feed travel. So once again I have a range of 261 here. Um, 310 on the top end and 210 on the bottom end. So 261 is about right. In practice, and I'll get into this more in subsequent videos, but in practice you want a balance between the two. Uh, it doesn't have to be an identical balance each time. Sometimes you can crank up the heat voltage more. Sometimes you want a little more wire feed, but those are the main two parameters that all MIG welders need to be adjusted for. Now, how you adjust uh, is different from machine to machine. This is fairly sophisticated, and it's got a digital control, so it's basically infinite control over those two parameters. Less expensive machines, you kind of have a preset uh, level for the voltage and wire feed rates. 
another big thing you need to realize when you're talking about MIG welders is the, the two different modes that you can MIG weld in. One is um, using shielding gas and the other is using what's called sh self-shielding wire. Uh, in both of those cases, it comes down to the simple physical fact that when an arc is occurring, the metal, of course, involved is molten. It's very hot, way too bright to look at with your bare eyes. Uh, and in that state, in that heated state, it becomes very reactive with oxygen. So you can get what amounts to a very fast rusting right in the weld pool area. And you're going to get a terrible weld. There's just no way around it. If oxygen is allowed to encounter the molten weld pool, then you're going to have a bad weld. So there's two solutions to that. One solution is the configuration that I have my machine set up here, and that's to use um, an inert gas. So inert means that it doesn't react. An inert gas that floods over the weld zone while it's molten, and it displaces the oxygen. So it protects the weld from oxygen for that second or two that it's molten as you move along when you're welding. So uh, in addition to the wire uh, that comes from a spool inside the machine, I will show you that in a minute, uh, there's also gas traveling through this cable. It's a pretty sophisticated cable, really. The gas flows out of these holes here. I've, I've taken this shroud off. The gas flows out of these, these holes and out the end of the nozzle, which you can see is kind of hollow around the outside, and that gas protects the weld. So um, this is a, a blend of argon and carbon dioxide, and this is the shielding gas of choice for welding mild steel. If you're going to be welding other metals with the MIG welder, you might have to change and go for a different shielding gas. Now, it's kind of a complicated thing, though, to have shielding gas, you don't just need the welder, you also need a regulator and a hose, and you need the tank. Where I live, these tanks aren't available to own. You have to rent them. They're about $100 a year, and it costs about $100 to fill this tank up. Uh, how long does it last? It's hard to put your finger on it, but fairly long, we'll say, because there, there is a lot of gas in there, but it's still a hassle, and you have to pay more for a machine that can operate with shielding gas. So there's another alternative. Uh, you don't have to use any gas at all. And the wire that's used is actually hollow. And inside the hollow of the wire is a substance that when it's heated and burns, I guess, during while well, you know, the arc is generating some heat, it creates a shielding cloud around the weld zone. Now, it's a little bit smoky. Uh, there's no smoke when you use something like this. So it's a little bit smoky. And the results aren't quite as good for shielding. So the weld is not going to look quite as good. But it's still going to look pretty good. And there are many people, uh, hobbyists especially, who just use the self-shielding wire. They keep things simple. No gas, no tank rentals, no regulator. And it works just fine. It's not an issue of strength, really. It's an issue of appearance. The weld is going to look nicer, neater, smoother, more controlled when you use the shielding gas. So now I want to show you inside. All MIG welders have an inside of some kind or another where the spool of wire is stored. So this is just straight wire, as I said, because it's designed to be used with the shielding gas. It's 25 one thousandth of an inch in diameter. This machine can use 25 thou, 30 thou, 35 thou, um, even larger, I think, in some cases. But I find that the 25 thou to be good for small welding. The bigger wire uh, is suitable when you have to deliver more metal to the joint, so a bigger joint. Now the self-shielding wire, because it's got that little space in the middle, is larger than 25 thou. It's 35 thou, um, but it doesn't deliver quite as much metal as a regular 35 thou wire because it's got that shielding gas stuff inside of it. But um, let's just switch on here and I'll show you how it works. So the spools come large, like this, or smaller, whatever you like. And as soon as I pull the trigger, uh, there's a, a motor feed in here that's going to start drawing the wire off the spool and pushing it all the way through the cable. So you see I... That 
that's the way it work, that works. Now, the speed at which it draws wire through the mechanism is controlled by that wire freed knob I was telling you about before. And if I wanted to, if I wanted to change the wire, or if I ran out of wire, I would loosen this off. This comes apart like this, and you can see the drive mechanism in here. It's pretty clever, really. See, there's the drive wheel. Now, this wheel here, if you can see, it's got a little groove in it. That groove is suited to this size of wire. So if I was changing wire diameter, I'd need to take this off, replace it with one that has a slightly larger groove. The actual driving happens up here. In this. You see there's a gear here. The gear engages the other side of the gear right here. There's a motor drive in there. And this surface of this top disc is what drives the wire through. It doesn't seem like it should actually work, does it? I mean, <laughs> pushing a little wee wire like this all the way through a cable that could be bent or twisted as you use it, but, uh, but it works. It works quite well. Oh, right down here you can see, too, uh, another thing. This, this guide right here comes off, and you see it's for 0 0.025 to 0 0.035, so 25 one thousandths of an inch to 35 one thousandths of an inch. That's the size of wire that this backing plate is suitable for. I use my welder almost exclusively for welding mild steel. So that's steel pipe, plate, things like that. And you'll probably be the same too, but a machine like this is much more versatile than that. And then this chart shows. So um, we've got uh, metal thickness here, and then we have the type of wire we're using and the different sorts of metals that we can weld. So this would be for mild steel. We have some stainless steel options here and aluminum with the right kind of gun. Um, and you can also use this machine for stick welding, which is kind of just like a regular arc welder in that there's a, a, a holder that holds a welding rod. And that rod takes the place of the wire feed that you see down here. So uh, a lot of variety. And in practice, you'll probably settle down and just use you know, a few of these. Uh, typical thicknesses, you know, eighth inch, three six quarter inch, three sixteenths quarter inch. That's probably what you're gonna stick to. Most of the material that we want to weld in the home shop is like that. And it is a bit of a hassle too, to be honest, to change over. I mean it could take me fifteen or twenty minutes to change a kind of a wire. I don't want to do that all the time. But uh, that's an, an overview of things. And now I'm gonna give you a little welding demonstration and I'm gonna show you not just how the MIG welder works, but also the difference that gas or no gas makes to the results. So I did two different passes on this, this test chunk of steel here. The first pass is from here to here, and that's with shielding gas running. And you can see the, the weld is quite smooth. Um, I think I would have liked better penetrations or better melting with the surrounding metal, but the bead itself is, is quite handsome looking, nice and smooth and solid. The second pass was from here to here, and I shut the shielding gas off, just so you can see the difference that it makes. Now, I actually started from this end, and I don't know if you noticed, but the sound of the arc changed as I went past about this point, because there was still some shielding gas in the hose, but when that was spent, there was just full-blown oxidization going on here, and we, we lost our regular sort of sound that we want to hear, the frying eggs, frying bacon sound here, and it changed to a much more spattery sound here. 
Now, there are some pock marks in the weld. This weld doesn't actually look as bad as I thought it was going to. It's not as bad as it sometimes gets, but it's not very strong, and it's because there's, there's holes and, and gaps and little pock marks because of that oxidization that's going on. So there you have it. There's the uh, basic MIG welding uh, tour and an example of uh, gas and no gas welding. In this section, I want to talk about safety precautions. Uh, this is a question I get fairly often. I mean, welding looks really, you know, ooh, sparks, heat, danger, electrocution, all that stuff. So there's a natural reluctance uh, and uh, caution uh, about the process. But the great news is that it's very easy to deal with the safety hazards. And they're essentially uh, five safety hazards, or at least the perception of five. Um, there's, the, there's the shock hazard. Am I going to get shocked by this welder if I do something wrong? Um, there is the burn hazard. And there's heat, of course. Uh, what am I going to do to prevent myself from, from getting burned? Um, there's also the, the vision hazard. That's probably the most crucial because the light given off by the arc from any kind of an arc welder, really any kind of welder, whether it's arc or, or torch welding, it's very, very bright. So um, what do you need to do to protect your vision? Uh, what do you need to do to protect your lungs? Uh, it, what is the fume hazard? You know, how serious is that? Uh, what do I need to do to protect myself? Uh, and then there's something obvious, just the, the burning things down hazard, so catching fire. So we're going to look at, uh, at each one of those individually. Uh, beginning with the shock hazard. So what's, what's the chances, what are the chances that you're going to get a, a shock, either an uncomfortable shock or even a lethal shock from a welder like this? And the answer is the risk is extremely low and that's because the voltage involved is also very low. Typical voltages as measured from the, the tip of the welding wire to the workpiece that is connected to this ground clamp probably runs around 15 or 20 volts. A uh, welder like this shows you what the operating voltage is. You know, that's just a little bit more than a car battery. And nobody ever worries about getting electrocuted from a car battery uh, because the voltage isn't high enough to ram that electricity through a human body, essentially. There's too much internal resistance for that to happen. Uh, another reason why the shock hazard um, is pretty much non-existent when you're doing electric welding is because you're well protected. Uh, I mean, you're going to be wearing, at a minimum, you're going to be wearing a pair of these leather gloves, and that offers some insulation value. You're going to be wearing uh, footwear that insulates you well from the ground. So I have never even gotten a tingle from an electric welder in 40 years of using them. Uh, so it, it looks like it's a hazard. I mean, a big flashing spark, of course, yikes, that must be dangerous. But from an electrical point of view, um, it's, it's not really dangerous. Uh, when you take the proper precautions, um, your safety is assured, and that's because the voltage is so low. Um, now, of course, there's heat involved. There's the burn hazard. What do you do to protect against that? Well, that's pretty obvious, really, um, and that's where protection and safety equipment comes in. Um, you're going to want to use gloves at a minimum. These are welder's gloves. Now, what I find, I'm right-handed. I hold the welding gun with my right hand. I tend to support my hand, my, my right hand, with this left hand. And that's why I usually wear a glove only on my left hand. I could wear it on my right hand, but you know, I hardly find it necessary because the right hand is, is fairly far back from the action. It's protected by the other hand, and not wearing a glove on your, on your gun hand allows a little more control, a little more fine control. But if you want to wear two gloves, that's great. Uh, there are going to be some sparks coming off from the welding process. Not a whole lot, and that's why uh, you might want to wear a leather jacket. There are leather welding jackets that are quite flame-proof, quite fireproof, and they protect very well. Um, now, of course, and I'll get to this in a minute, you're going to want to wear a, a welder's face shield. You absolutely have to have one of these. There's no two ways about it. But even with a helmet like this on, 
it's possible for sparks to fly up and land on the back of your head. It happens once in a while, so that's why they've invented these welding caps. It's uh, you know, a, a non-flammable fabric, it keeps your, your hair protected, it keeps your scalp protected. And um, essentially that and some, some solid footwear uh, where sparks cannot affect it, and you're protected against the burning hazard. Um, it's really, as I said, it's really very simple. Now, the vision hazard, the, the, the vision issue, uh, as I said, is where this uh, welding mask comes in, welding helmet. Now, about 20 years ago or so, there was a revolution in technology for welding helmets. Until then, uh, there was a, a lens that was very, very dark. And that's the lens you looked through. And the reason it was very, very dark is because it had to be that dark in order to protect your eyes once the spark has started. Um, the problem is that until you start the spark, until you start the arc, you can't see anything with a traditional helmet on. So uh, you have to get good. And when you pull that helmet down, you have to get good at remembering where you need to start. And, and you start the arc and then you can see and adjust yourself and get into the proper welding rhythm. People learned how to do this, how to essentially start an arc blind, and people got very good at it. But it is a hurdle that you don't necessarily need to have to cross because uh, today's generation of welding helmets are what they call auto darkening. So if you put this thing on, uh, it looks like you've got a, a pair of sunglasses on. It looks, from your point of view, like you have, are wearing a pair of sunglasses and that it's, it's darker, but you can see perfectly. Now, as soon as the arc starts up, and I'm talking 20, 30, 40 milliseconds maybe. You know, there's a thousand milliseconds in a second, so 30 milliseconds is next to nothing. Within that period of time, the lens will automatically darken. So it actually darkens before the bright light has a chance to hurt your eyes. Uh, and uh, once again, technology has really made it all very simple. You, you, you buy one, you put it on, it works. That's essentially it. And it also means that there's one fairly substantial skill, namely starting the arc blind, one essential skill that you don't need to learn. Uh, and, and that's because you can see your work ahead of time. Now all, all of these, um, Auto darkening helmets have controls on the inside to allow you to adjust the amount of darkening. They allow you to adjust how fast the darkening kicks in. Uh, they're really great. I, I have known professional welders who have poo-pooed this, especially when they first came out. Uh, oh, that's just for beginners. Or real welders don't need auto darkening helmets. But you know, you put an auto darkening helmet even on an experienced welder and they say, hey, boy, I really like this. This really works. And that's why 95% of all welding helmets nowadays are the auto darkening style. A helmet like this used to cost $500 or more. Now you can get a decent one for uh, around 100 or less. So really quite an advancement. So, so far we've talked about the shock hazard, the burn hazard, the vision hazard, uh, and now the fume hazard. So whenever you weld anything, because of the high temperatures involved, fumes are going to be released into the air. So are they dangerous? What do you need to do about that? Well, welding should always happen in a well-ventilated environment. So if you can move outside to do your welding, well, that's great. That's as, that's as, as, as much ventilation as is humanly possible to get is to actually go outside. Uh, and I weld outside whenever I can. Here in my shop, I have a garage door. I can, everything's on wheels. I can wheel it outside really like to weld outdoors. Um, but I can't always weld outdoors, so I have an exhaust fan here in my shop. It moves about 250 cubic feet of air per minute, which is roughly three times the volume of a bathroom fan. So it really does keep the air clean. Um, and those two things, either welding outside or welding in a mechanically ventilated interior space, that's great. Now there is one, special issue I need to mention, and that's the welding of galvanized metal. So um, my, my course, the MIG welding course, is all about learning to weld mild steel, which is the most common kind of steel around. Most of the welding that most people want to do is mild steel. 
Sometimes, in order to protect that mild steel from rusting, it undergoes a process called galvanizing, which takes that metal, cleans it, immerses it in molten zinc, and the zinc bonds to the surface, kind of like soldering almost. It's like you're coating the whole thing in, in solder, except it's zinc, and zinc is highly corrosion resistant. You can weld galvanized metal. Uh, you're, you're best off to, to grind off the galvanizing in the area you want to weld. But even when you do that, there's still going to be enough heat generated that it's going to vaporize some of that zinc. Uh, that gives off well, fairly billowy clouds of white smoke. And that, that zinc smoke can cause a condition called welder's flu. Essentially, it's a kind of low-grade poisoning, in a sense, and you feel kind of listless, like you have the flu. Um, it's easy to avoid that, though, and it just means you have to take extra precautions for welding in a, in a well-ventilated place. Also, if you grind, grind the galvanizing off in the area you're going to be welding, it's greatly going to reduce the amount of smoke given off, and you're going to get a better, better weld, too, because Zinc doesn't actually weld very well. It kind of gets in the way of a proper weld. So as useful as it is for corrosion resistance, it can cause this, this, this white smoke that can make you feel sick. Um, the conditions aren't long-term, um, but you better, better, better safe than sorry, essentially. So lots of ventilation all the time, but an exceptionally large amount if you're welding anything with a zinc coating. So the final, uh, the final hazard, the, the, the burning down your shop hazard, burning down your house hazard, uh, that would be caused by sparks. Sparks are going to fly, so you want to make sure that there's nothing flammable around where those sparks are likely to land. You're going to want to give yourself uh, kind of a cushion. So, you know, don't just move as far away as you need from that pile of wood or whatever. Move twice as far as you need. Uh, don't weld anywhere near gas cans or propane tanks or anything like that. It's really pretty obvious. Um, and, as an added precaution, just in case something does catch fire, you want a plan B, you want a second layer of protection. So keep a fire extinguisher handy. That's easy enough. Um, I have never had to use a fire extinguisher to put out a fire caused by welding. Every once in a while, um, well, like the last time, I was rubbing down some surfaces to remove grease and oil after I had cleaned them. And there was a little bit of alcohol left on a, on a paper chop towel. It was on the ground. A spark landed on it, caught fire, stepped on it, put it out. I mean, there, there's no big deal. If you keep the combustibles far back from the, from the area, then you'll be fine. So essentially, bottom line is, uh, despite appearances, despite the fact that um, all kinds of arc welding looks impressive and dangerous and, you know, uh, all that stuff. The safety precautions you need to take to be perfectly safe, they're really very simple and, and quite straightforward. So in this part of the webinar, I just want to touch a little bit on choosing a welder. Um, this is a question that often comes up um, with the learners in the course, and I spent a fair amount of time pointing out specific machines that currently look good. Uh, there are more good welders out there than I know about, uh, but I do recommend specific models um, as part of the interaction. You know, when I say I'm a course instructor, uh, I've created the course, but there's also backing and forthing while the course happens by email, sometimes phone, sometimes video conferencing. So when you are deciding what kind of a welder to buy, uh, there are questions you need to answer for yourself before you even get down to brand uh, or cost. And that's what kind of welding you want to do. Now here I have uh, two extremes from the MIG welding world, essentially. So this is, this is my honking big full-featured multi-process MIG welder. Um, it, it welds mild steel with this kind of gun. It also happens to have an attachment for another kind of electric welding called a st stick welding where you actually hold a, an electrode that is consumed as you weld. Uh, this, this welder can also be configured to weld aluminum with some different equipment and of course using a different filler wire. So that's the high end of the spectrum. Here where I live in Canada, a welder like this is about $2,500 or so. So yeah, pretty serious investment. You've got a, 
um, know that you like MIG welding before you in invest in something like this. I use it all the time. I consider it indispensable for where I live out in the country. I'm always fixing things, fabricating things, uh, salvaging equipment and whatnot. So that baby comes in very handy. But at the other end of the spectrum, we have a MIG welder like this, which is completely portable. Uh, just plugs into a regular outlet. Um, it doesn't have any sort of a tank with compressed gas or anything like this. Uh, it's just a portable, small MIG welder. And with something like this, you can weld metal, you know, up to about an eighth of an inch thick or so, maybe a little bit thicker. So the capacity of this bigger machine is greater. You can weld thicker metal. Uh, it, you can deliver more filler metal to the, to the weld. There's more heat. There's more penetration of the metal. Just, just bigger, fatter, stronger joints. Um, this is a bit more of a finesse machine, but, uh, but the cost is lower too. So if you just think, well, I, I kind of might like MIG welding. I'd like to try it. Well, for two or $300, you can actually get one of these and, and you're ready to go. As soon as it comes in, you can, you can start using it. So you essentially have to ask yourself, um, will I be satisfied? with a small welder to weld thin materials, or, or do I need something thicker, something stronger for thicker metal? My recommendation, if you're at all uncertain, my recommendation would be to start small, see what it's like, um, and then upgrade if, if you like the whole process. And that's not a waste of a small machine because even though I have a, a big machine like this, sometimes the small portable units are really handy. So you can, um, you can, take them anywhere you want. Um, they're not big. Um, you can carry them under your arm and um, you can weld a surprising number of things with them. Now, another thing you need to, to ask yourself about is which type of MIG welding process do you want to, do you want to use? Because uh, there are two. There's the gas shielded, it's called, and that's what this is configured for. And then there's what's called the self shielding. And this whole business of shielding is important to understand because when the metal is, is molten, when it's liquid, <clears throat> it's highly reactive with oxygen in the air. And if you don't protect that weld pool from oxygen in the air, then you're going to get a very fast rusting. It doesn't actually look like the rusting on your car, uh, but it will leave the, the weld bead um, porous with holes in it and the weld will not be nearly as strong as it could be. So there's two ways to solve that problem. You can pipe in uh, inert gas from a, a compressed cylinder like this. And in, in, in this case, with this welder, the gas travels up the cable on the outside of where the electricity is delivered and where this, this wire is delivered as well, because it, it moves out into the, into the, the weld pool. So, there's compressed gas from this cylinder flooding out of the nozzle because there's a space around the perimeter. It's flooding out around the nozzle and it's protecting that molten weld pool until it can cool to the point where it's not so reactive anymore. Now, alternatively, with a welder like this, it doesn't have a compressed gas cylinder. It uses what's called self-shielding wire. So the wire is hollow and inside the hollowness is a substance which will form uh, small amounts of smoke which protects the weld in that case. Now I can use self-shielding wire with a big machine like this. It's the only kind of wire I can use with a small machine like this because it can't accept, it doesn't have the fittings and whatnot to accept the gas cylinder. But that's essentially what you need to think about. Um, do I want to go the added complication and expense of gas shielding, which by the way yields a nicer looking weld or if I'm just starting out or I want to keep things simple, will I go with self-shielding? So small machines like this, the kind that plug into a regular outlet, I have never seen one that accepts shielding gas. The small welders, I've only ever seen them have to use self-shielding wire. With the bigger machines, you have an option. And th there's also a kind of a machine that is fairly large in size, but it does not come from the factory with the fittings needed to run a shielding, shielding gas. But these, I'll call them intermediate machines, can be configured 
they, so you buy uh, extra fittings and a gauge and whatnot, and you can convert that machine into one that is gas shielded. Uh, serious welders, and I don't mean necessarily professional welders, but just anyone who takes their MIG welding seriously will probably go to a gas shielded machine, at least in time, if not at the beginning, because the welds really are beautiful. They're, they're beautiful, they're easy to do. Uh, this works great, it's less expensive, less troublesome, but the Cadillac of MIG weld beads you'll get with the gas, gas shielding. Well, in this part of the webinar, <clears throat> I want to talk to you about what I think is the most important part of my online course, and that's troubleshooting welding issues. Um, very few people pick up a, um, a MIG welding gun and get an absolutely perfect weld the first time. I mean, it does happen because it is a fairly easy process to learn, but more often than not, uh, there are issues. Uh, the weld could look spattery. Um, maybe the weld bead doesn't penetrate the parent material very well. Uh, maybe it's an ugly looking weld or um, there, there's, there's different um, stumbling blocks you can run into. And uh, what I would encourage you to do is um, alongside this, this webinar, the, 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 the link you went to, to to watch this webinar also includes a downloadable PDF file with some full color photographs of problem welds and the, the, the description of the problem, the cause of the problem, and the solution to the problem. And you know, out of all the coursework I do, I think, I think um, helping people to you know, get the plane off the ground, so to speak, um, you know, to get over the initial problems of, of welding and to actually reliably lay down an accurate weld bead in different situations, that's the most valuable part of the course. And it's really something that almost everyone runs into because the first time you weld, you're going to make mistakes. I mean, the welder might not be adjusted properly. Uh, maybe you're holding the gun at the wrong angle. Uh, maybe you have not yet developed enough hand-eye coordination to be, uh, to be accurate in your hand movements. Because if you want a nice pretty weld bead, you have to be very precise with how you move the, the welding torch. And, and that's a matter of the right kind of practice. So whatever you do, be sure to download that chart so you can kind of see the typical problems that people run into and how that might be solved as well. So just to finish up now, um, you know, essentially, as I said, this, this, is, this webinar is to give people a bit of a better understanding of what I cover in the course. Um, you have lifetime access to that course. That means lifetime access to me. So if a year down the road you're welding again and you have trouble, and just send me an email. Uh, call me on my phone. Uh, if necessary, we can have a video conference. So lifetime access and uh, essentially this is the fastest and easiest way to master the MIG welding process. And, you know, I don't know about you, but lots of creative people I know, uh, they yearn to be able to master metal, to, to cut it, to join it. Um, my course doesn't cover just the welding process, but actually the fabrication process too. So there's sections there about the tools you need for cutting metal, drilling metal, fitting it together, polishing it, stuff like that. So thank you for joining me. Uh, if you have any questions at all, uh, send me an email, call me on my cell phone. Uh, I'm happy to answer them for you and uh, all the best and I hope you enjoy a, a wonderful welding hobby.